they breathe. On May 25th, the world changed in a matter of minutes. The death of George Floyd, a black man killed while in police custody in Minnesota, sparked a global movement igniting a sea change in public attitude towards race. As the streets erupted, Ray Green, a black man from Yorba Linda, picked up the phone to check up on an old friend. I called him because I knew that this was going to make his job harder, and it was going to make his job difficult, and I knew that it was going to have an emotional effect on him too. On the other end of the line, Scott Willie, a white police officer, was overcome with gratitude. Ray was the first one to call me, wanted to check in actually and ask how we were doing. I got pretty choked up and just said, uh, still gets me. The two met a decade ago when Ray moved into Scott's old neighborhood, a predominantly white community in Orange County. I used to see their son Connor outside, you know, shooting ball. hoops and playing ball. And I could just tell he was Connor. a kid that was into sports. And so I started talking to Connor and uh, got to meet his dad, Scott, and uh, you know, we kind of hit it off. The family soon became close. Ray and Connor even started a sports podcast together. Testing one, two, three. Three, two, one, we are rolling. Soon after that, they got an idea for a series of ball games between Scott's police department and the kids in Ray's at-risk youth program. When I talk to Scott, you know, I get the perspective of not only someone who's a friend, but he's a police officer. He takes everything in. He doesn't just react to the one side. And he told me stories that I just don't even think about as a white person. But as close as they've become, when Ray first saw the video of George Floyd, he was worried about the effect it might have on their friendship. Uh, has it been difficult uh, for you guys to have conversations or to continue the relationship? At first, I was hesitant because you don't ever know. You don't know how they're going to take it. You never know. It can ruin friendships. And so when I talked to Scott, he said, you know what, what that officer did was wrong, you know? And once he said that, I knew, okay, all of a sudden, I can, I can talk to this guy. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Shoot, man. Growing up in Orange County, Ray is no stranger to racism. He knows what it's like to be the only black guy in the room, but he and Stacy made a decision early on to stay in the OC, mostly so their girls could get a better education. It makes you strong. And growing up in that environment, you, basically kind of get thick skin. It's a lesson their 14-year-old daughter, Ray Lynn, had to learn as early as preschool. An incident that really sticks out for me um, was when two, there were kids, they were twins, and they told her, um, we can't play with you because you're brown. Mm -hmm. And so then the conversation starts at three. Even something as simple as hair can trigger awkward conversations. My 14-year-old was asked, um, you know, how, how long can you keep those braids in and how often do you wash your hair? On the subject of hair, for years, Stacy drove an hour and a half just to find a salon that caters to black customers. And while a hair salon may not seem like a big deal, it is. And it's a struggle that many black women endure. I, I would say that if there's, you know, ignorance um, as far as uh, people who are not black, not understanding what our hair means to us and uh, how important it is that people are respectful, you know, about how we wear our hair and what we, you know, what we decide to do to our hair, you know, without making comments like, oh, well, that's an interesting style, like using words that are maybe like a put down. The James Charles no, really? But in the age of Black Lives Matter, her conversations with her daughters have taken an even more serious turn. I still have to make sure that I remind her um, how to enter a store and don't rummage through your purse because you don't want anyone to think that you're putting something in your purse. So in my head, I'm just, you know, going through like, okay, let me just, um, if I have like a purse or something, anything I need, like money or anything like that, I'll just keep out with me so I don't have to like take it out in the store. There is plenty of tension among Scott's children too. 20-year-old Connor and 23-year-old Casey have grown up idolizing their dad and his work. My dad is somebody I've looked up to uh, my whole life. He's taught me a lot about how to respect people, how to live um, 
with with enthusiasm and kindness towards everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but these days, they feel they have to play it down. I see him as my dad. I don't see him as a police officer. But when people generalize about police officers, I, of course, always think about my dad. He respects everybody. It's gotten so bad, they've had to take a break from social media. It's hard to talk about it in these times because I feel like I kind of have to tiptoe around things, and I want to be respectful of both sides, too. Scott's wife, Kelly, says the last few months have been awful. He is in a vehicle that, to me, looks like it's a police vehicle. Um, he does always wear a jacket over his shirt so that people can't tell he's an officer, but I do worry that someone will pick up on it or follow him home. And I do worry that, you know, someone might just, out of pure hate, shoot him. Coming up, the national debate over police misconduct plays out in this longtime friendship. We're kind of making that assumption that we're all white cops, and that's not, that's not true. I don't believe in the few bad apple thing. 